your own you don't mind. It's all these others anymore. We should probably get started tonight. You know? Being really tardy. Yeah, right. Ladies, chatting hey, in the back, boys hey, hey, chatting hey. in the front. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're here. That's right. And, and the Lord's here. Fellowship. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So three or two or three together together. And That's right. His name. Wow. Yeah. Amen. So um, so we decided on a theme, I think, for our women's yep. conference, The Beauty Within. Um, the most beautiful thing about a woman is her heart for Christ. Amen. And um, uh, looking forward to that. Um, and I was thinking, Sheila, remind me to get your friend's number that does the horses. Oh, yeah. This ministry does therapy for these women for horses. So I think there's a divine connection waiting there, too. Yeah. Told you, one year. I know. She watched, yeah. <laughs> After they got home and I already lost, told them. They really want to come back. Yeah. One year. Yeah. They'll be moving to Des Moines in one year. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I have a praise report um, from my dad. Yes. Um, before I could even share the pray, the report, the request, the prayer need, um, it was all reversed by the time I got to visit him today. Um, last night, his platelet counts and my blood cells just plummeted. Um, and they were very concerned. They were postponing his um, permanent pacemaker surgery. They, were, they told him to camp out in the hospital. It could be up a week, could be more. Um, and then today, uh, more, fine. Great, more. Tomorrow, his permanent pacemaker, hopefully, close up the old one on Friday, hopefully, get home this weekend. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Um, Amen. Um, so, thank you for your continued prayers for me, dear Frank. He really appreciates it. Yep. And, um, yeah, praise the Lord for that. Any other prayer requests or, or testimonies tonight? I think everybody already heard mine, so I thought it was yours. Oh, yeah. Sheila didn't hear it. Okay, for Sheila. We'll do it for Sheila. Uh, so, Eric and I were supposed to go away this weekend to Dubuque as a delayed anniversary getaway. And um, now we're going to Chicago because a uh, kombucha bar in Chicago wants our kombucha on tap. Oh, wow. Cool. So, the worst cool. that's good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Woohoo! Lord. Yeah. 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 Great place. Yeah. I may say this again on Sunday, but thank you all for uh, befriending my friends. Uh, Margie's like man, Sheila. Some of you know the story, but they've been disfellowshipped from their church since uh, December and just been bouncing here and there in Missouri trying to find a home. She's like man. This is the first place I can say since December that felt like a home. Wow. <laughs> and she just, I mean, they loved everything, Mike, from the wash-up to the ministry. I mean, I, if I was back there, I would have been going like this right next to her. I mean, like, Tim just preached right right where they were and right exactly what they needed. They were so blessed and so ministered to from beginning to end. So that's what we want people to feel when they come in, right? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So keep them in prayer. Get home safe. Amen. And for this ministry that she was just talking about, they have a big, huge ministry that Margie just kind of felt like the Lord had laid on her heart. So September 8th, 9th, and 10th, they had this Lou Stewart. If you look him up on YouTube, you'll see all kinds of stuff about him. That is coming to Union, Missouri, and just going to try to break down some walls and barriers and boundaries between churches, between the violence and what the enemy's going and doing in that little town. So, yeah. expecting great reports. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, before I forget, there was a shooting at the uh, uh, convenience store right down here, East 38th and oh. Easton, <coughs> yesterday. Uh, there was a fatality mm -hmm. situation, so it was right down the street. So, mm -hmm. rise it up. together to celebrate the praises and the victories, Lord, and we come to lay our hands at your feet. We come together together to worship you and to hear your word, Lord, and renew our minds. We've come here to be encouraged. We've come here to be strengthened, Lord. We've come here tonight to praise your name, to lift you up, because we know that you are worthy to be praised, Lord. Now, wherever the members of, this, members of this body are, wherever they are, north and south and east and west, Lord, be with them tonight as we miss all of them that are gone. And draw them back, Lord. Draw them back. Yes, Lord. 
special blessing we're sending to our pastor and Sally, Nathan and Sally, Lord. Let these last two weeks, I pray that they've been a time of renewal and refreshing and healing. And we just ask a special blessing as our pastor and Sally come back this weekend. Lord, we just ask you to bless Mike's time away this weekend, his well-deserved vacation. Bless him with your presence, Lord. Lord that's, we know that that's his heart, Lord. Just bless him with more of your presence, Lord. Speak and whisper in his ear and just fill his cup, Lord, to overflow. And we just ask that as you raise up Roberto in that place, in that worship leader place, we just pray for Roberto and the ministry that he has with financial peace. And as he and Kelly search out home, Lord, that you would bless them at just the right place. We thank you for those who are willing to step up when Pastor is gone, Lord. We thank you for the word that's come through Tim. We thank you for the leaders who have yet to step forward, Lord. We thank you for the gifts and the callings that you've given each of us, Lord. Help us to walk boldly in them as we discover every day more of those gifts that you have that we've just never opened. Bring them to our remembrance, Lord. Bring those unwrapped boxes to our notice, Lord, that we might search them out, Lord. And Jesus, be with us tonight. Fill this place with your presence, Lord. Fill this place with your presence as we praise you and as we seek after you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and all of our spirit, Lord. Be with us tonight, in Jesus' name. cell phone tonight, please turn the ringer off or turn it off until after the service. Uh, financial peace. I think we're uh, entering week four on Monday night. I'm um, hoping this will be the first of many times. So, um, yeah, and just a reminder, uh, no, Saturday, November 11th will be our women's conference. Um, we have a theme. Uh, I think we kind of have a time. We'll probably do something similar to last time. And um, I'll get some postcards. The save the date postcards. We'll get those out. I'll try and get them done by Sunday. I'll try my best. They have some available so we can start getting the word out about that. Um, so um, do you make an invite page for that? For Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, if you do Facebook, I'll do the closer. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah. And then, um, all right, offering. Ron, you want to come take an offering tonight? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. 
us your righteousness so that we can stand in your presence, in the presence of your angels, before the Holy of Holies, Lord, before your throne of grace. You made that exchange so we can be one with you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless the word as it comes forth, Lord. Let it be from your lips to our ears. And let our minds be renewed. Give us wisdom. makes me think of the dross and the gold and where the purified is gold. We are to examine. We are to look and scrutinize things to make sure they're pure. And I always think, you know, we talk about, you know, the FBI says, well, how do you, you know, how do you tell counterfeit money? Well, you don't study the counterfeits. You study the true. Mm -hmm. The true, the real, the authentic. And then you'll know when something's not authentic. And I think it's the same for us. It's that same sort of philosophy. And the second definition for dokimazo is to recognize as genuine after examination, to approve, to deem worthy. We have a responsibility to deem things worthy or not. Worthy of allowing to come into our hearts and our minds. We are battling up here, and we are the ones that deem things worthy or not. And, you know, we're all human. We all have ears to hear and mouths to speak, and sometimes the mouths are faster than the ears. <laughs> and, you know, at, any of us can be led astray, right? Those, those things, those doctrines, the religious spirit, the things that we have in us from our lives as Christians can twist 
and change our perspective and sometimes steal the wisdom and the truth of the teaching that, uh, that we're receiving. And the third strong word is Greek 1252, diakrino. So these all kind of sound uh, similar. I don't know if anybody's noticing a pattern. Diakrisis, dokimazo, diakrino. These are all the different words. And this one talks more about judgment, right? So this is translated as to doubt, to not deem authentic, right? To doubt, to judge, to discern, to contend, as in not allowing to know when to battle, when to fight, and waver, right? To know when to waver and when not to. And it's the definitions, there's a lot of different definitions for this word, to separate, right? To, to pull apart. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we know separates? The Word of God is the two-edged sword that separates, right? So when we go to the Word of God, if we have discernment, the Word will separate it for us. Mm -hmm. um, to make a distinction, to discriminate, and to prefer, right? Discrimination has a negative connotation to it in our culture, but we are to discriminate between truth and falsehood. Right. That is our job as Christians, to know the difference. Um, to discriminate um, for other reasons, obviously, it's not what I'm talking about. But, um, to make a distinction and to separate. To learn by discrimination, to try and to decide. You know, I feel like as Christians, we're told not to judge, right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, get into some scriptures. But we're told not to judge, and so we forget that we're supposed to judge what we allow to come into our minds and our hearts. We're supposed to judge it. We're supposed to judge teachers. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to judge the teaching. Yep. We're supposed to judge the word that we're receiving all around us. Yep. And we can have trusted sources, and, and all the time I hear things, songs. Oh my gosh, what happened to Christian music? It's just false. I listen to these lyrics, I have to change the song, because I'm like, that's so not right. Right. God didn't cause the storm. Right. I, I mean, like, I, I have to shut it off, because if we're not discriminating, and if we're not rejecting, then all those things are going to just cause confusion in us. Right. And so we are to give judgment, to determine, to give judgment, to, to decide a dispute, right? There's a dispute going on all the time in my mind, you know? Um, when, someone, when someone brings a scripture to me and it doesn't fit, I'm having a battle. And I, and I know what I think, but the Lord has dealt with me that if, we, if our hearts are pure, it's not about right or wrong. It's about His truth. And if we will just stop... Right? When we hear something that we don't like or that we disagree with, if we'll stop and if we'll search it out in the Word, we'll have perfect peace and there's no confusion. Mm -hmm. There's no confusion. Right. If there's confusion, then we're, not, then we're not discerning. We're not taking the time to scrutinize and separate it apart. Because as you go to the Word, the Word itself will separate all the straw and the chaff. That's what you just prayed about, Ron. He'll remove all of that. As we seek in His Word, He will divide it and it will become clear what is truth. Amen. And part of, so this, this Strong's diacrino also means to withdraw from one, to desert. How many times do we need to know when to just get out of Dodge? There are some places <laughs> we shouldn't be, there's some people that we shouldn't be around, and there's conversations that, quite frankly, we shouldn't be having. Right. That we need to just exit. Right. And we need to have discernment to know where we ought to be, what we ought to be doing, the, the, the conversations we ought to be a part of. Um, and then this is the definition that kind of surprised me. To separate oneself in a hostile spirit, to oppose, to strive with and dispute, and to contend. Now how many of you know there's only one person that we're to contend with in the Bible? Great. That's Satan and all of his followers. That's the only person we contend. So discernment means how, if, if we're going to talk about the armor of God, we're going to talk about battle, we have to discern, first of all, what we're fighting, who we're fighting, and how. And if we're going to separate ourselves in a hostile spirit, it better not be towards our fellow man, right? It better not be. And we better know who we're opposing. And if we're going to dispute it, let's dispute it with the word of God, right? And the last one, to be at variance with oneself, to hesitate and to doubt. And so I will tell you that if there's, if you're hesitating, if there's something in us that isn't settled, then we have to go back, and we have to scrutinize, we have to go back to the other one, right? The dokimazo. We have to go back and scrutinize. We have to go back to examine. We have to search it out. We have a responsibility yeah. to ourselves to not stay confused about something, but to yeah. go back to the Word and sort it out. 
God will just do that for us. He always does. If you've ever, every time I've ever had a question, and I just, I literally pick up my Bible, which I didn't bring my Bible up here, it's all in my notes, but I literally pick up my Bible and I say, Lord, show me. And I just open my Bible, and I'll find stuff. Right? Or I'll Google now. I Google more than I do. I, I used to literally just flip the page of my Bible and say, Lord, show me. And I would find what I was looking for. Now I Google it, but <laughs> it's the same thing. Lord, show me. He will always show us the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Yes. He leads us to truth. And if there's something unsettled in us, rather than just reject it, let's settle it. Let's have the, the word to settle it. Um, and the root of the, the diakrino is, uh, there's two different Greek words, to separate thoroughly, literally and flexibly, to withdraw from, to oppose, to discriminate by implication, to decide, to hesitate, to contend, to discern, to doubt, to judge, to be partial, to stagger, and to waver. The definition itself is against each other, right? Yep. How can it be? How can it? How can it be to discriminate, to withdraw, or to judge, or to doubt, or to contend? They don't even agree with each other. Right. But when in context, the word of God will prove itself. And so that's why I think discernment, we'll get into that in just a second. Discernment is for the mature, okay? Discernment is not something for the babes that are just learning the word. Because they're going to use the word, and they're going to, well, I'll call it spiritual malpractice. We'll get to that in a second. Malpractice, right? It's for the mature. In church, we have got to mature. Amen. We have got to mature. That's why, you know, I, I've never studied this before, but I want to be a mature Christian. I want to... I want to see all the promises that God come to pass yes. in this body and in, na in this nation and in the world. And so it's time for us to grow up. So can we agree that discernment is essential? Can we agree that we must be able to tell the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error? Okay. First scripture will go to John chapter 14, verse 17. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The truth is in us. And when the truth in us sees and hears truth outside of us, it recognizes itself. Right? There's always that connection you feel, or that light bulb that, you know, I call those light bulb moments, when there's a connection made, you go, yes. That's because the truth that's in you is connecting with the truth outside of you that you're taking into yourself. Amen. Uh, and also John 15, 26. <laughs> but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Comforter is the Spirit of Truth. The truth should comfort us. The truth is what gives us peace, because we can have no doubt. The truth gets rid of the doubt. The truth gets rid of the turmoil. It gets rid of the strife. It gets rid of all the other stuff, because the truth simply is. It simply is. Mm -hmm. And it removes all that other stuff from us. Mm -hmm. But what about the Spirit of Error? Uh, 1 John 4 and 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We are supposed to recognize the spirit of error, right? And, that's, and I don't know how many of you have had that moment. I, for me, it's, it's Christian music anymore. I hear it and I go, I can't even listen to this. I, I just have to turn it off. And there's something in me that goes, no. You just talk to someone or you hear something, you just go, no, that can't be. That's not God. That's not the God that I know. And if we, if we look at his character, and if we, if we look at who we know him to be, and we hold the scripture up to that, that gives us the perspective to know, do I need to scrutinize it? Do I need to examine it? Do I need to pull it apart by the word? Because the word confirms itself. There's no confusion in the Bible. Right. It will always confirm itself. And also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. This is a long passage, but I think it's important I want the context of some of these, so some of these passages are a little bit longer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's a, the iniquity is a mystery. It's confusing, right? Iniquity is always confusing. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, we can't even trust the signs and wonders. Right. Right? We can't trust signs and wonders. That is not necessarily authentic. Right. Just because we're seeing miracles doesn't mean it's from God. Satan has a power. Not the power, but he has a power. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. We are to love the truth. To love it. To protect it. When you love something, you fight for it. When you love something, you protect it. When you love something, you nurture it. When you love something, that is your focus. That is all-consuming. That they might be saved. People are watching us. People are watching us. And what we are listening to, they assume is truth. Right? Right. <clears throat> And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mm. It feels good to believe a lie because he, because the deceiver makes it beautiful. He, you know, he's the what is it? No, get that second, but you know, he comes as an angel of light. He's attractive. Mm -hmm. How do we know, church? If we can't tell from the signs and wonders, right? Because we're assuming if they're doing good things, if they're healing people, it's got to be from God. How do we know? <clears throat> so let's talk about the false teachers and the false teachers. Let's go to Matthew 7.15. <clears throat> I have a very trusting nature, and I think one of the things that upsets my husband the most, because I have a very trusting nature. I assume that people say what they, that mean, say what they mean and are going to do what they say. And it doesn't always work out so well. It's but I still choose to believe people. that people are good. I hope. <laughs> I'm an optimist. That's, that's what you call me, an optimist. But I'm not unrealistic. You wear a false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Mm -hmm. And how do you know? How do you know? Good because of how they treat people. Mm -hmm. Because of what they're after. Right, there's people that come and they're, we've had those friends in our lives, right? And they just come in and they butter you up and then all of a sudden they're stepping back. They're causing drama. Mm -hmm. They're causing dissension. And, you know, that's the easiest way I can kind of relate to it. They come and they just want to, they just really you. They're just looking for someone to be their next drama. push -over. Or to be their next whatever. Drama. You know, people that, that those, um, those parasites, right, that leech off the, 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 the scales on the whale that, you know, take a ride on the whale's back. They're all over, you know, and they're in the church, too. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, they volunteer a lot in the church. <laughs> not going to go there, but I'm just saying there's people that we need to just be careful, right? Yep. Just be careful and test the spirits. Yes. Um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14. 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14. This is the scary part. Don't get the good part. <laughs> this is not the false side. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Again, workers in the church. Coming to deceive, coming to right. gather glory for themselves. Seen it. Coming to make it about themselves. Coming to feel important. Coming to <clears throat> share their wisdom and their knowledge. <clears throat> coming to, it, it's, it's the giving alms, right? It goes back to the publican and the, the Pharisee praying, right? 
Oh, but I've done all that you said to do, Lord. I have, you know, and, and what did Jesus say? They are whitewashed tombs on the outside and dead bones in the inside. Mm. And I'm telling you that house of cards never falls, but if we don't ever look inside a right. person's heart, it will tell, you know? And I go back to that as metals. Sometimes these fiery trials we go through are to the proof of the pudding, right? When we go through the fires, what we really are comes out. Mm -hmm. And it's those hard times, you know, whether in the church or whatnot, and it's those hard times when people either start bailing or they start showing their true colors and they end up bailing anyway, you know? Mm. So we are to not be deceived. Matthew 24, 24. Matthew 24, 24. For those shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Church, we have got to have our eyes open, and our ears open, and our hearts open, and our Bibles open. We have got to search the Word. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, because I want to talk about the, the first thing I thought of when I was praying about discernment was Jesus being tempted by Satan after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He went into the wilderness and he was tempted at the enemy. And what's always struck me about this is the enemy used the Word of God. Mm -hmm. He used Scripture. And so I asked the Lord for some wisdom about this section of Scripture. Then when Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And I think that this whole thing happened so he could teach us how to understand when the Word is being used mm -hmm. for his purposes right. or it's being used for man's purposes. Right. right. So, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights at his weakest, his physically weakest moment, the man of God, the man, you know, the son of man, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Verse 4. Sorry. It's all right. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and he set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, Right? He copied his own phrase this time. It is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, even higher, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Get out of here. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Satan used the word of God as a weapon against the man, Jesus, the son of man. Jesus used the word of God as a weapon against Satan. The scripture that Satan used was pointing to a man. The scripture that Jesus used was pointing to God. Amen. That's the difference. You bet. Mm -hmm. The difference is our aim. Where are we sending the word? The aim makes all the difference. Are we using the word of God as a weapon to do battle with Satan or with the person? Are we looking to God? Are we, are we using the word to God? Or are we using the word to, to people? Uh, let's go to Matthew 16, 23. And, and, I, and I say our aim makes all the difference because if we're speaking the word, we've got to know what we're speaking the word to. Jesus, right? Jesus, this is after Peter tried to stop at Gethsemane. Peter tried to stop what was going on when they were trying to arrest Jesus. And Jesus turned to Peter, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Right. He wasn't speaking to Peter. He was looking at Peter and he was talking to Peter, but he wasn't 
using the word of God against Peter. He was speaking to Satan. And that's what we have to understand is the difference. Peter was not the enemy. Satan was the enemy. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the what rulers you? of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. People are never our enemy. People are never our enemy. People are never our enemy. Satan right. is our enemy. Mm. And when we use the word, we are to do likewise, right? So when we do battle, we are to do likewise. We use the word of God against Satan, not against man. We are never to use the word of God against each other. And I'll tell you, the church is running rampant with spiritual malpractice. If the word is being used to control people, it's false. If the word is being used to scare people, it's false. If the word is being used to manipulate people, it's false. If the word is being used to separate people, it's false. If the word is being used to cause strife between people, it is false. Right. We use the word of God to fight Satan, and to, and to train our own selves. We don't use the Word of God to get somebody else to do something we want them to do. Right. Right. Satan and the re religious spirit, all this, it's false. It's false. doesn't matter what you want to call it. Religion wants to use the Scripture. It's the law, right? It wants to use Scripture to control people, to manipulate people, to get them to behave and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. God is not interested in what you're doing. He's interested in who you are and Amen. who you say you are. Amen. We should test the fruit of the teachers. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And I say this with a very humble spirit right now because I'm teaching you. It's always a little scary when you get up here and teach because you've got to eat the words that you're preaching. Right. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. There's that word again. That's discernment. If we're truly discerning, our love will abound if we're discerning properly. That ye may approve, another translation of discernment, right? That ye may discern or approve things that are excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Yes. Church, if we are loving one another, we don't have to worry about it. None of this stuff even matters. If we're truly loving one another, it's when we start lashing out to one another and hurting one another that we need to really look at the Word. Exactly. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's not our job to judge people's hearts. It's not our job to judge people. It's our job to let the Word judge our hearts mm -hmm. and our intent. Mm -hmm. The only person that we were ever intended to control is ourselves. Right. And, and, and when we relinquish that control to the Holy Spirit, then we're safe. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 5.14 and this is kind of what I was alluding to that only the mature can eat the food. Uh, Hebrews 5.14 But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, that are mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There you go. Good is God. Evil is not God. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's not God, it's evil. Right. There's okay things that aren't God. They're evil. And only the mature are trusted with the solid food of the word. We're trusted that we will not abuse the scriptures and that we will not, we will not go around with spiritual malpractice abusing each other with the scriptures. That's why this is for the mature. Think about the nature of God. God is love. Does it make sense in the context that is being delivered and through love? If we hold everything up to the lens of who God is, it becomes very easy. Judgment versus discernment. We have to understand the difference between judging and discerning. We're to judge the spirits, not people. Right. Right? And we need to understand the difference. 1 Corinthians 2.15.
1 Corinthians 2, 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Right? If we, we want to be spiritual, right? Spiritual is a good thing. And if we are spiritual, we judge all things. We judge all things through the lens of Jesus Christ. Period. Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. What's that mean? Well, I just said we're supposed to judge. I said if we're spiritual, we're supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge the spirits, not each other. This is talking about judge. Don't judge another person, right? Don't judge another person because you don't know their heart, right? We're not to judge people. We're to judge the spirits. To judge the word that comes at us, whether it's true or whether it's not. So test the spirits. Don't believe everything you hear. Discernment is careful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things, right? Discern. Prove is another word for discern. Search it out. Prove that it's right. Search it out in the scriptures. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Good and evil. There were two trees in the garden, right? Mm -hmm. Good and evil. There were a whole bunch of trees. There weren't just two. There was only one that was evil. There was only one that was evil. And they hated it anyway. All we need to know is it's good or it's evil. And we have the word to prove it out for us. Discernment is a gift of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 10. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. To another, the working of miracles is the gift of the Spirit given out to each according to their measure. Uh, to one, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. It's a gift of the Spirit. There's a supernatural gift to discern the spirits. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen that in operation, but in my mind, how I think of it and how I guess I've, I've kind of worked in it is you know the name of a spirit behind a situation and you know what to pray against it. It reveals itself to people with this. Um, spirits have names, right? Mm -hmm. all, all these spirits, all these imps of the enemy have names. And once you know its name and you can pray against it, it's defeated. And they try to hide and they try to especially hide from people that can discern their name. That's what, to me, that's what it means, is the discerning of the Spirit. You know the name, and then you can cast it out. Because I've always thought that once you know the name, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Discernment is the key to life and godliness. Second Peter 1, uh, 3 through round. Well, I might skip that one. Uh, write that one down and look at it later. It's a long passage. Second Peter 1, 3 through 10. But discernment is the key to life and godliness. Um, discernment is not gullible. Uh, discernment is not double-minded, it does not deceive, but it's for the mature only. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 15. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Is the word edifying the body of Christ, right? Yep. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, until the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, right? We're to be mature. To be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, not being able to discern the spirits, by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Right? Discernment is not false, but is the pure word of God. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believeth and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. 
For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now, this, when I read this today, I was struck. I've always wondered what the big deal was about food. If it mattered, why, did, why, why was there restricted foods in the law, but now all of a sudden they're clean? I've, I've always thought that was odd. And it occurred to me as I read this today, word, the Word of God, food, is the representative or the analogy for the Word of God. Food equals the Word of God. And food laws are examples of clean and pure word and false and unclean words, false teaching. There's good words, there's unclean words, and there's, there's unclean words, there's false teaching, and then there's clean, there's good words. And so I think that when, when the Bible talks about food, right, before the Jews had a law, right, and that's why they could only eat certain things, because the word was only this strict version. They weren't, didn't have access to everything. They didn't have access to all the word. They only had access to this portion of the word. Now through grace, they have access to everything. And everything becomes clean. And it really struck me that when people want to argue about food, and start an argument food ministry, food is the word of God. Food is the word of God. And that's why people, people want to get hung up about food. It's not about food. It's about what kind of word are we putting in ourselves. Yep. What kind of word, what kind of doctrine is it good? Is it, is it feeding us? Is it maturing us? Is it giving us strength? Or is it empty sweets that don't nurture our bodies? Because now it's about health. It's got nothing to do with whether it's clean or unclean. Is it healthy for you or is it not? Is it healing your body? Or is it decaying your body? Is it killing you from the inside out? Is it healing you? Is it strengthening you? Is it, is it helping you get stronger? Or is it just stealing your health? Is it stealing your strength? And that's why I think that those food principles are so important in the Word of God. Anyway, that just thrown that into those bonus. <laughs> Life or death, sister. Life or death. It is. <laughs> okay. And lastly, discernment is not separation, right? Discernment is not separation. It is cohesion in one body, one family, in one God. 1 John 2, verses 19 through 24. This is the last one. First John 2, 19-24. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not doubt. They no doubt would have continued with us. They would have stayed with us, but they went out. That they might be able to make manifest that they were not of us. They wanted to, they didn't want to be of us. They wanted to go tell those they weren't from us. But ye have an ocean from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you know not the truth. But I have written to you because you do know the truth, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist. He that denieth the Father and the Son. This is our litmus test for truth and for falsehood. If it points to Jesus Christ as the risen Savior, it's truth. If it points to anything else, it's false. Or it's useless. It's false. It's useless. Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledges that the Son has the Father. There is no separating. You can't accept Jesus and reject Father, and you can't accept the Father and reject Jesus. There is, there is one. Let that therefore abide in you. Keep that in your heart, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So let that one thing remain in us, right? If it points to Jesus, the resurrected Savior, if it reveals who she is, if it points to Him, then it's true. If it doesn't, it's not. And so lastly, I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 4. Um, I'll just read. I have the Amplified. The Amplified says the testing of the spirits, and the Message Bible says don't believe everything you hear. So I'm going to read from just the Message Bible. My friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying creatures loose in the world. Here's how you test for the genuine spirit of God. Everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came in an actual flesh and blood person, 
comes from God and belongs to God. And everyone who refuses to confess faith in Jesus has nothing in common with God. That is the spirit of Antichrist that you heard was coming. Well, here it is, sooner than we thought. My dear children, you come from God and you belong to God. You have already won a big victory over those false teachers, for the spirit of truth is in you. The spirit, the truth that is in you is far stronger than anything in the world. He that is greater than us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. These people belong to the Christ-denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. But we come from God and belong to God. Anyone who knows God understands us and listens. The person who has nothing to do with God will, of course, not listen to us. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. Will we listen? So anyway, I pray that um, you guys got something out of the lesson tonight. I know I did. This was very eye-opening for me. Um, I tend to be very trusting. I, I need to be more skeptical uh, and not just trust. Um, I think we need our spiritual antenna up. We have got to get our radar out and we have got to test the spirits. Um, I think that there is just such a large volume. There's so much information that we have access to between TV and radio and songs and, and all the teachings. And there's just so much out there that we just can't, we can't afford to not test it and not try it. Amen. And so I encourage all of you, um, and remember that your aim makes all the difference, right? Amen. Our aim makes all the difference in where we're aiming the scripture at. So, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.